good morning and welcome to the 19th and last meeting before the summer recess of the committee. Um, and if you wish to use tablet devices or mobile phones during the meeting, please switch them to the flight mode as they may otherwise affect the broadcasting system. Some committee members may consult tablet devices during the meeting. This is because we provide meeting papers in digital format. Uh, we have received apologies today from Alec Rowley. Uh, agenda item one is a decision on whether to take agenda items four and five on consideration of the oral evidence received in the future work programme in private. Are we all agreed? Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, our next uh, item today is consideration of a negative SSI, the Building Scotland Amendment Regulations 2015, SSI 2015-218. Uh, members have a cover note from the clerk explaining the instrument. Uh, as you will note, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has comments on, to make on this instrument. Do members have any comments to make on this instrument? I should have said no comments to make on in this in instrument, sorry. Uh, are we agreed not to make any recommendations to the Parliament on these instruments? Thank you very much. Uh, we now move on to our third item of business today, which is an oral evidence session on the Accounts Commission for Scotland's 2015 Local Government Overview Report. Uh, I'd like to welcome Douglas Sinclair, Chair, Accounts Commission for Scotland, Fraser McKinley, Director of Performance and Audit and Best Value, uh, and Cathy McGregor, Audit Manager of Audit Scotland. Uh, before we move on to questions, do any of you wish to make an opening statement? Mr. Sinclair. <clears throat> Perhaps I could. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, the Accounts Commission welcomes the opportunity to discuss with the committee its 2015 Local Government Overview Report. For a number of years now, councils have had to cope with reducing resources, rising demand and ever-increasing public expectations. Our audit work tells us that councils have generally cope well so far. Until now, they have dealt with reductions in income largely by cutting employees but this alone is not sustainable in the longer term. Councils will face pressures beyond next year of a scale not previously experienced as budgets are expected to become even tighter and demands on services continue to increase. Many councils are now reporting a budget shortfall, that is a shortfall between the projected income and expenditure. And over and above the known reductions, um, the Conservative government is, as you know, committed to reducing the deficit in the lifetime of this Parliament. And the Chancellor will announce where those expenditure reductions are to be made, both in the emergency budget on the 7th of July and in the public spending review uh, in September. Again, that is bound to have implications for Scotland's finances and, in turn, for Scotland's councils. In the Commission's view, councils need to have effective long-term financial plans to give them a good understanding of their finances and future pressures and they need to identify all practical options for addressing these pressures and funding shortfalls, partly by making better use of benchmarking data and increasing the involvement of service users and local communities in developing ways to improve services and to help save money. The challenge for councillors is to make best use of the money that is available and to take the difficult decisions now to avoid storing up problems for the future. There are, of course, a lot of changes going on in council staffing, management and delivery structures, including, of course, the integration of health and social care, the continuing use of alios to deliver services. It is absolutely crucial in the Commission's view that governance and scrutiny arrangements keep pace with all these changes. Community planning and health and social care integration require a continuing focus on governance and partnership working, where the responsibility for good governance is shared and which depends crucially on building a culture of trust between partners. Convener, my colleagues and I are happy to answer questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Sinclair. Does Mr McKinley or Ms McGregor wish to add anything to that? No, no thank grand, you. thank you. Um, if I can move straight into the report itself, um, and on page 29, uh, we have uh, quite a lot about... Uh, consulting service users and communities, uh, but you feel that there's a need to involve these folks more in planning and delivering services. Um, I wonder if you could uh, give us some good examples of where that is happening uh, and where you think that that is maybe not happening to the degree that it should be. 
Um, because from my past experience, and I'm sure from others around the table, uh, when you do involve communities themselves, you tend to, to reach better decisions. Well, there are some examples given, convener, in paragraph 57, that the, West, the Western Islands Council brought together views of communities and used them to influence de decisions and develop services. Falkirk Community Planning Partnership in the Bainsford area involved older people in developing new ways of providing services to help enable older people to live in their homes uh, longer. And Perth and Kinross Council is facilitating working communities where people who need social care services and their families are developing local services to meet service needs. I think what um, all councils um, need to do more is engage with the service user as well as the community uh, to find out the experience of the service user in their journey in contacting the council and how that can be improved as well. Um, I think satisfaction surveys are useful but they actually have a limited use because if the council is a monopoly provider, for example, in terms of road or refuse collection, there's no alternative provider for the public to be able to benchmark the performance of their council. Um, so there's a limit. They're useful service, um, satisfaction service, but they have a limited use. I think we'd like to encourage councils to do more work in analysing the experience of the individual service user. I think that's particularly true with the development of self-directed support, for example, how, how, how well does the council respond to somebody who's applied for self-directed support? What's that journey of engagement with the council been, been like? I think that the areas like that, councils have still, have, have still a fair bit to do. I think that, that's the point I would make. I don't know if you want to add to it. Uh, thank you, convener. I mean, I think the, con the, the committee probably know as well, if not better than we do, given all the work you've done around the community impairment bill, which was obviously passed last week, that that, that bit of legislation could be a genuine step change in how this all works and I think one of the things that we'll be very interested in is the extent to which councils and other public bodies really embrace that as an opportunity to, to do that or whether they kind of grudgingly think it's something that they have to do and I think um, as well as the stuff that's in the bill around um, public assets uh, I think some of the stuff around participation is potentially hugely important um, in getting communities involved much much earlier in uh, not just saying, do you want this or do you want that, but actually d designing and, and kind of co-production in, in, the, in the jargon in, in a genuine sense. So, so we'll be very, very interested um, to see how the Community Impairment Bill is actually enacted in practice because it does have potential to change this quite significantly, I think. Um, the report highlights good practice, as it always does. It doesn't really point out bad practice. As we've gone around the country um, to discuss the Community Impairment Bill and other aspects of work that we've been carrying out, uh, we go to. We've been to a number of places where, uh, you know, folks have told us, yes, people will come out and speak to us about certain things, uh, but they go away and seem to forget the views that we have given um, uh, at those uh, events, and they don't feel that that's proper consultation at all. Um, is that something that you have found uh, in terms of formulating? the report and in, in your day-to-day -day work. Do you want me to pick that yeah, one up? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think there are lots of examples of communities that are very frustrated with this stuff. A lot of, we've spent a lot of time recently looking at the Castle Tower situation, for example, in Argyll and Butte, um, where uh, we have a community there that is very frustrated with how that's gone. Equally, in that case, we have a council that's clear that um, they made the right decision based on um, the facts that were in front of them and wider considerations of best value. The Commission have asked us in Audit Scotland to look at how the audit of best value is carried out and this whole discussion around community engagement and community involvement will, I think, form a bigger part of that discussion. The, the, the BV guidance from 2003-04, when you read it now, does feel a little bit outdated on this issue. It talks about um, community consultation, um, and I think the world has moved on a great deal. I think expectations are very different. I think the Community Impairment Bill and other things have really moved that agenda on, and, and our audit work has to keep pace with that and reflect that. So I think we will be probably in future convener more challenging around this kind of issue, and in a sense, expecting councils to be starting with the proposition that yes you can do that unless there's a very good reason not to rather than rather than the other way around and I know some of the work that you've done have picked up some really powerful examples of where communities feel very very frustrated at, at not being able to move through the machinery of councils as quickly as they would like.
Uh, you mentioned Castle Tower there, and uh, I don't think there's anyone in this Parliament that's not aware of that situation because uh, uh, Michael Russell has, uh, has brought that to the fore in recent times, it has to be said, including it to this committee. Um, one of the things which we've had, um, uh, which we've never had uh, prior to this meeting uh, previously, um, is correspondence from members of the public round about um, certain aspects of your work. And uh, one of the emails that all members have received is from Aberdeen, um, and it's round about public objection to unpopular investment decisions. Uh, and I'll, I'll just read what the folks have had to say about this. Um, they say, currently the public are involved in pre-application consultations for major developments and is consulted in all planning applications. Councils consult on major planning policy developments. Investment decisions are often communicated to the public poorly, often shrouded in secrecy, claiming commercial sensitivity. This has led to a breakdown in trust between some councils and the people who elected them. Auditing bodies often fail to respond adequately and in a timely manner with the potential for catastrophic effects to the nation's built environment. And the question um, that they ask is what can be done to restore the public's trust in or respect for councils and auditing bodies who consistently react dismissively to the public's objections to unpopular investment decisions for major projects and who seem to intentionally delay their response or refuse to respond to legitimate requests for information on how such decisions are reached. How would you respond to that, Mr McKinley? Um, so I think clearly our, we are very interested in and committed to good governance convener and uh, the transparency of that. Um, and I think we need to be better at helping people understand what our role is in some of these big things, because a lot of these things are planning issues first and foremost. And particularly in big um, uh, planning decisions in places like Aberdeen and others, they are very controversial. People. Um, it's important that people feel engaged, and some people clearly in some in some of these cases don't feel engaged. The extent to which... So our engagement with that as auditors, I think, is something we need to really think through quite hard. Um, we are, at the moment, looking to put together some guidance which tries to set out a bit more clearly for people that are writing to us what our interest in these kinds of things in, is, kinds of things are, and indeed what our what, what our limitations are as auditors in a in a judicial, quasi judicial process process like planning. Um, but certainly in, in relation to issues of good governance and transparency, we would always be very interested in that. And the commission and the overview report, I think, set out quite clearly their expectations of councils in terms of what good and transparent governance looks like. Uh, I, th these folks have concentrated on the investment issues rather than any planning issue in terms of the questions that they have suggested that we ask today. And I think, you know, I don't want to go into the planning situation because that's not sure. your guys' uh, work at all. But I think that sometimes these things become intertwined in folks' minds. Yeah. Um, and we kind of separate them out to deal with yeah. the individual things. Now, obviously, the investment is a concern to these folks. Um, and you're saying that sometimes you don't relay back to them your reasoning for doing or not doing something. Well, I, I'll, I'll, if I'll just finish this. Uh, uh, so, so I think we do do that. I think there's probably ways in which we can do it more clearly uh, and on occasion more, uh, more quickly. Um, so I absolutely accept that, convener. And I guess for us, at the end of the day, we're interested in the process that the council has followed. And if at the end of the day councillors make a decision to invest in something and not other things and the process has been followed and that's entirely legitimate. That's local councillors. Mr Sinclair? Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree with that. I think that the, the interest of um, the controller of audit, the interest of the commission is on the process. Was the process comprehensive? Were the reports by officers comprehensive? Were councillors given the full information? Uh, were they given all the options that are open to them? But at the end of the day, you have to respect the fact that people have elected the, the, the council and the, the council has that right to make that decision, a decision which maybe that some of the public do, do not like. But, the, but as long as the process has been thoroughly and properly followed, then we, you, we have to accept the, the consequences of dem democracy. Um, and, and ultimately, if people are aggrieved, then they have the option that they can stand for the, the council at the next election. But that's how local government works. You're not going to satisfy all the people all the time. Our interest as a commission, 
as, as the controller has indicated, is to ensure that the principles of good governance have been applied by the Council in making decisions. Uh, thank you. Um, again, I would draw your attention back to your report about consultation and the fact that these folks obviously feel that they have not been consulted uh, properly on this investment issue um, uh, and don't feel that their voices have been listened to. So, I mean, we're saying, you know, ultimately the responsibility lies with the councils. I wouldn't disagree with you on that point. I think we all understand that. But in terms of uh, your um, focus uh, in the report on consultation, um, that seems to be sadly lacking in certain areas of, uh, of council's business. I certainly take your point that if councils are going to engage in consultation with members of the public, there is an obligation on the council to feedback their views on the consultation and why they've taken a particular decision. They have to complete the loop. Uh, and uh, as um, Mr McKinley has indicated, in the next iteration of Best Value, we will look much more closely at how effective uh, uh, councils are at engaging with their local communities and what the feedback loop and, and follow-up is by the councils. It's, it's, an, it's clearly um, an important part of the Community Impairment Act, I think I can call that now, uh, and we will take that on board in our future Best Value work. Thank you. Claire Adamson, please. Just a supplementary, and I'm, so, I'm sorry to focus on the Aberdeen beautiful city, but it's, it's very relevant in the news today. And obviously, it is a council that undertook a referendum of consultation with people um, and, and then rejected those findings. So, it's a, you know, I'm just trying to, to um, get a feel for what's happening, and, but not specifically in the Aberdeen context. But my understanding is that the project that's been suggested there is, is um, a joint partnership with the council will be left holding... The risk, should the hotel development not realise the projected income? And I would just like to get a feel for, for what um, you would expect the Council's assessment of risk in, in undertaking some of these joint ventures and big projects is. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That, I think that's a great question, and that, that is absolutely of interest to us. So um, our auditors... Uh, I'll try not to use the specifics. So our auditors would routinely, um, when big investment decisions like that are made, would look at, as, as the chair said, the process that the council has followed to get to that point, including their understanding of risk. Um, where there are big investment decisions and, and uh, where capital investment in particular is being undertaken, our auditors would routinely look at the delivery of the capital plan. And increasingly these days, what we're finding is that there are some um, new and innovative funding models coming through, which do bring different kinds of risk. It's difficult to keep up with the, um, with the, the different formats that there are uh, these days. And I think the Commission has been very clear that one of the key things in there for officers is to ensure that elected members, when they're making the decisions, understand the risk that they're taking on. So again, it's not for auditors to say that it's right or wrong or it's good or it's bad. What we do see in, in, in the risk assessment is do you understand what that risk is how are you managing it and um, what are the mitigating actions that you're taking to to manage those risks and i think that's becoming increasingly complex in a world where capital budgets have reduced significantly and um, people are looking for more innovative sources of of capital investment and funding which is becoming enormously complex and um, the chair might want to say a little bit about the the commission's interest in helping councillors and expectations on councillors who already have a very difficult job to do to understand all of that stuff um, which is becoming increasingly increasingly complex mr sinclair yeah i mean i think our, you know managing risk is one of the principles of good governance um we want um we don't want councils to be um risk averse but they need to be risk aware that's the, that's the really important bit and the point that Mr McKinley has touched on is the critical importance of ensuring that elected members have the necessary skills and training to understand um, what they're doing in terms of managing risk as part of their job, because they are the custodians of public money at the end of the day. They have to make those decisions. They have to ensure that they have the skills and competence to ask the right questions of their officers and get the right answers that they're satisfied with. And can I just finally ask on that on that point? Obviously, you know the committee is very interested in other funding models, and we're looking at pension funding um, at, at the moment. Um, but as you say, these are new models. So, um, would you expect the council to be seeking expert external advice on that and legal advice if that's not, 
you know, if it's a project that the council maybe haven't used that model for before? I think yes is the short answer. Um, I mean, depending on what it is and what it's for, there are things like the Scottish Futures Trust, um, which would play a role in there. But absolutely, I think um, when we look at things like tax incremental finance or the growth accelerator model or all these kinds of things that, that kind of trip off the tongue, it's really important that officers and, and, as the chair says, members understand what that is, what they're getting into. And importantly, as the Commission said in their recent report around borrowing, that they understand the long-term implications of that. So what does this decision that you're making today mean for um, the commitment you're making over the next 25, 30 years in some cases? So you need, really do need to look at the longer term in all of this. Thank you. John Wilson, please. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Just to follow on from that line of questioning at the present moment, is that the, in the Chair's opening statement, introduction to your report, uh, in page 6, at the top of the page, you actually say councillors also need to assure themselves that there is sufficient capacity within their councils to deal with day to day business as well as management, manage improvement and change. How do the elected members get sufficiently or get sufficient information to allow them to make that assessment whether or not the information is being provided? Because if I take you back, a number of years ago to PFI PPP contracts when they initially came out. Uh, the, a lot of local elected <coughs> members relied on their own officials to advise them in terms of the establishment of these contracts. And as we now know, a lot of the contracts, uh, if we'd known then what we know now, we'd never have actually signed up to. But elected members, as you quite rightly say, are the custodians of the council. Uh, they rely on the advice and information they receive. How do you ensure they get the best advice and information? Well, let me just give a little bit of context to that. Uh, one of the points we make in our report is that um, councils um, have reduced, uh, balanced their budgets by reducing their, their staff complement. They've spent something like £380 million pounds on voluntary early retirement, all the indications are that at least half of Scotland's councils will continue to shed staff. One of the concerns we have about that is the loss in capacity, particularly in services like human resources and in finance, and that's a particular issue in smaller councils, where you may have one person who's, who's an expert, for example, in, in, in housing benefits, and that person goes, and it's difficult to, to replace that person. So uh, there is a responsibility on the chief executive in terms of workforce planning to ensure um, that he, inf he or she informs the council where, there are, where, there, where he believes there are shortfalls in capacity. And if there are shortfalls in capacity, it's his responsibility, his duty, uh, to ensure that the council can gain access to that expertise, be it from another council or be it in, in the private sector. So that's, the, that's a critical, critical factor. Workforce planning is really, really important to ensure that councils retain a balanced workforce and they have the capacity, particularly as the whole pattern of service delivery becomes more and more complex. The, the day of the council being the sole provider of services, as you rightly point out, Mr Wilson, has changed dramatically. So ensuring the council has the capacity uh, to monitor uh, that, that changing pattern of service delivery uh, is fundamentally important. So there's a real obligation, I think, uh, a, on the Chief Executive to ensure he advises the Council, but B, to ensure that the Councils have the necessary skills and the confidence to ask searching questions of their officers to make sure that they, they, they can be assured the capacity is in place. I'll go back to the original question I asked, for how do we ensure that Councillors are suitably equipped to ask the pertinent questions of the officials to understand whether or not they are getting the best advice the best information and the, the information and advice that they are receiving is pertinent to the decisions that they are making. Well, let me let me um, take this in a slightly different a different angle. Um, I think it's fair to say that virtually all councillors do a very good job, um, but the world in which they live now is a much more complex world than they than say in 1975. I mentioned the fact that the the differential arrangements for service delivery. And um, one of the things we found in our reports is that the take-up of training by councillors is incredibly variable. It's fair to say that um, most councils do provide good um, induction training, 
But in terms of continuing professional development, there's a real question mark about how good that is. It's difficult to imagine somebody being the chair of a finance committee unless they're financially literate. It's difficult to imagine somebody being chair of an education committee unless they have a good understanding of education policy. So I think there's a debate to be had about how effective the, the training is for councillors. Given they're in charge of a budget of £21 billion that employ over 200,000 people, have we got unrealistic expectations of our councillors? Do we need to do more to ensure that they are properly trained? There's nothing in the Code of Conduct that requires a councillor to undertake training. There's no standard job description for councillors. Uh, Mr McKinley mentioned the um, best value guidance of 2003, the eight characteristics of a best value council. But that guidance is absolutely silent on the skills that councillors need to discharge their responsibilities. It just assumes it, they're, they're there. Local government is a big business, and I think there's a debate to be had about how effective the, the training is. And way back in 2008, the Scottish Local Authorities Remuneration Committee, which no longer exists, recommended that there should be a standard job description for councillors, that every councillor should have a training needs analysis and a personal development plan. I think that there is really a debate to be had, and I'm, I'm not in any way demeaning councillors. I'm actually trying to make sure they, are, they have the skills and, 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 and the competence and the confidence to do the kind of job that you're talking about, Mr Wilson. I think there's a debate to be had about how good that training is. Um, I think two years ago, the Commission published a report, Roles and Relationships. We talked about roles and relationships between members and officers. Uh, and we're going to revisit that report to, uh, to try and get under the skin of the report, to try and ascertain how effective training and development is actually for, for councillors. My response, and I should have declared at the beginning <coughs> of my contribution, convener, that I was formerly a councillor mm. and my <coughs> wife is currently a councillor. So I do have uh, some experience of what's happening in local government at the present time. I may be too close to a particular local authority, but as I do get a general feeling for what's happening in local government. But that goes, takes me on to the next issue that I wanted to raise, and, and it's back to the Chair's introduction, is the issue about the scrutiny. Uh, and you, you mentioned, make specific reference to the Chair of the Scrutiny or Audit Committee should be a member, not a member of the ruling group, uh, because we, we now know we have coalition groups uh, in certain local authorities in Scotland. We recently had a situation uh, in a local authority in central Scotland where the chair of the, an audit committee was removed. Uh, now, the, the ruling group came up with various reasons why the individual was removed. Uh, but one of the, uh, the suspicions or one of the uh, allegations that have been made is that the, the chair of the audit committee was asking awkward questions about a particular contract that was awarded by the council. Have the Accounts Commission been involved in any way whatsoever in investigating the circumstances behind that? Well, perhaps Mr. Mr. McKinley, could it take the first part of that and then I'll come in? Yeah. Mr. McKinley. Yeah. Thank you, Convener. Um, so, yeah, we're very aware of the, uh, of the situation you're referring to, Mr. Wilson. Um, and we, I did ask the auditors in that council to have a look at, and as, as you probably are aware, it's on, the, it's on the front page of the Herald today, the the issue around um, the, the contract is actually with the Audit and Governance Panel in that committee today, in, sorry, in that council today, uh, and we'll be very interested to see what comes out of that discussion later on. In relation to the, the position of the convener, I asked the, I asked the auditors to have a look at that. Um, their view, which I'm satisfied with, is that um, the, the process was in accordance with the council standing orders, so in a sense no rules were broken. Um, now. Uh, I absolutely accept then there's a different question about the nature of the standing orders. Um, as part of that piece of work, auditors also looked at how other councils do this kind of thing, how appointments are made, how people are, whatever the word is, unappointed um, from committees. Um, and the reality is in most councils, it's a, it's a political process. There is a process through which um, in councils where there are party groupings, uh, it's part of that process and in other places there's, uh, there's, a, there's a process which ultimately involves council uh, agreeing to those things. I think, as you said at the start, and I'm sure the Chair will want to come in at this point, um, <clears throat> our interest more widely, therefore, is in the way in which, particularly for our, for our interest, things like audit and scrutiny um, committees and panels are led and chaired, how those appointments are made, uh, and indeed um, how you can 
um, remove people from those positions is something that I'm sure the Commission will be interested in in the future. Mr Sinclair? Yeah, I, I, just to um, <coughs> make a further point, um, in a world of coalitions and cabinets, good scrutiny is even more important. Uh, as Mr McGinn has indicated, it's a matter for each council to determine the arrangements for the appointment of the chair of the audit committee. But the Commission's view, and it's stated in our report, is, is, is absolutely clear. Paragraph 67, we believe that public trust, public confidence in scrutiny and audit arrangements is much more likely to be achieved if the chair of the audit committee is not a member of the administration, where the committee has clear terms of reference, wide terms of reference, is an adequate support to undertake its, its task uh, and it, it, uh, the members of the committee have the necessary skills and training to do their job. That's the Commission's clear view that if you want to ensure that the public have trust and confidence in the scrutiny and audit arrangements, that's what councils should be doing. I, I won't go into debate about standing orders because there are issues around that and how yeah. often standing orders are changed in certain local authorities to accommodate the prevailing political mood. But in relation to the issue about senior officers, and uh, Mr Sinclair made reference to chief executive, and the chief executive having an overarching role in ensuring that appropriate people are in place and advice and information is being provided. What, ha what training is the Audit Commission involved in in ensuring that we have relevant senior officers able to come through the council process to take on those roles? Because I know that the, in the last couple of years, as you've quite rightly said, some of the reductions that have taken place in staffing have been at that senior level. Uh, and how, how are we ensuring that the people that are being appointed to take on those, those tasks are suitably equipped to be able to provide the best advice and information? Mr Sinclair? Um, I don't know. There's no, there's no one organisation um, that does that. There used to be the Scottish Local Authorities Management Centre in Strathclyde University, which was, um, uh, if you want, um, a breeding ground. It's not quite the phrase I'm looking for, but a, 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 an opportunity for potential GV directives to, to learn their, to learn their, to learn their craft. Um, I mean, I think part of the part of the responsibility would lie with Solace to provide opportunities um, through learning sets and what have you for potential and future chief executives to understand what the, 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 uh, the job's about. I think there's also, in my view, a case for revisiting um, the terms of reference for the chief executive in the world that we now live. Uh, the, 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 the job description of the chief executive is essentially is the head of the paid service, but what does that actually mean in practice? What is the dividing line between the chief executive's responsibility to manage the council and the elected member's responsibility for policy on the one hand and scrutiny on the other? Where do you draw the line between policy and management and the degree of, of independence that the chief executive has? It's also fundamentally important that in the world of coalitions I've mentioned that the chief executives don't lose sight of the fact that while it is part of their job to help the administration of whatever colour to Im implement its manifesto, the chief executive still has that wider obligation, that wider responsibility to the council as a whole and to always act in the council's best interests. Thank you, Mr Stinkler, for that. Can we, I'll, I'll move on and let other members ask questions. That, but if there's time at the end, there might be a couple of questions. I somewhere. think there may be. Uh, Willie Coffey, please. Conveners, uh, and good morning to you. Um, Mr Sinclair, in your opening remarks, you told us about the UK Chancellor's budget proposals and the consequential impact that that's ultimately going to have in local government, local government services. Has there been any impact analysis of this sort of level of cut that's being handed down <coughs> basically from the UK Treasury through the Scottish Government to the local councils? Has there been any impact analysis on where the, the, the cuts will hit hardest and what councils might be trying to do to address that? I want to help on this point. We do make a uh, point in a report that funding to English councils has been cut uh, since 2010, 11, 15, 16 by 37 per cent. And there's a figure by the Office of Budget Responsibility which suggests cuts of 6.4 per cent. This is UK cuts. And 10, 16, 17, and 4.9 and 17, 18. But I don't know if there's any detailed anal analysis of the, the, the impact of eliminating the deficit uh, in the lifetime of the Parliament, what that would, the consequences, consequentials that would mean for the Scottish bloc. Ms McGregor, do you want to come in there? I'm not aware of, of impact that's been done unless 
Fraser. Thank you, Convener. So, not specifically, Mr. Coffey, but I think there's. It, 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 most people seem to expect that the NHS and schools will continue to be, in adverted commas, protected. Um, and obviously, the, the history is that that's then been passed through. Uh, the Barnet consequentials to Scotland, and obviously, those things make up a bigger proportion in Scotland than they do uh, in the rest of the rest of the UK. Um, but I think, in a sense, this is why the, the Commission has been very, very strong on councils doing their own long-term financial planning. And we know it's not perfect. We know they don't know what's coming in July or September, or so it's 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 not straightforward to do that kind of three to five year look. But we do think their scenario planning is hugely important. Um, we think they need to understand what the ranges might be. Uh, I think the cuts so far have been in the order of 8% um, so far to in, in local government. What would it look like if it was another 10, 12, 15 in future? But I think, importantly, each local authority area will want to think about that in the context of its own priorities and its own local community needs. So um, decisions in Edinburgh may well be different to decisions that are taken in Murray about where you choose to invest and potentially where you choose to disinvest. Um, we will, when the, the, the budget announcement comes over the summer, obviously be looking very closely at that, as many people will, and uh, continue to think about, well, what are the impact on, what is, what is the effect of that on public, all public services in Scotland and how, how are they responding to that? You, I think, interesting, just in the last week or so, there's been quite a lot of media coverage about councils doing exactly that, looking ahead, um, beginning to talk about some of the budget reductions that are going to have to make, beginning to think about some of the really hard decisions that are going to have to be made, um, which is why everything we've talked about so far in terms of elected member um, uh, development and training and the quality of advice they get is going to be even more important than it's ever been, because they've been making hard decisions and there's even harder ones to come. Uh, Convener, during my time in the audit committee, it was a pleasure to meet Mr McKinley several times there. I mean, this subject came up regularly about the continuing progress towards more and more cuts for the councils and how they could try to partner up and deliver shared services and so on and so forth. And I know, I know that Ayrshire has a joint roads service and there's good work going on across Scotland, but when is the time to assess whether that's working and delivering the efficiencies that we might have hoped for as a response to these continuing cuts? He's going to go for that one. Mr Sinclair? I, I'm happy to. I think shared services, have been, there was a huge investment in time and resource in shared services, the, uh, our birth the committee, for example, mm -hmm. in the west of Scotland. But in terms of tangible results in local government, there hasn't been very much. It actually would be a very interesting performance study by the Commission and the Auditor General to look at the spend in relation to shared services and what actually has been achieved. Our sense is that um, councils have rushed perhaps too much to shared services rather than looking at the scope um, for reducing unit costs because councils all provide the same services. You take um, the collection of council tax, the cost of doing that varies considerably from council to council, something like £4 to something like £14. Uh, and the, we, we believe there's more scope in the benchmarking families for councils to say, well, if we're at £11 and our neighbouring council's at £4, why is that? Can we simplify and standardise our process, you with me, to get down or to get up to the best in class? And I think there's... I think we, uh, as a commission, very much welcome the work that's been done by Cosland Solace in developing benchmarking families so that councils can make sure that every pound they spend is value for money. And there's still a long way to go in drilling down uh, and looking at unit costs to see, to see that, that. What I'm trying to say is that I think we, th we think there's a lot, a lot of savings that could be achieved in reducing unit costs, probably as much as it might be gained from, from, from shared service. And I think that's the where we would want to see councils continuing to focus. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, so where then would you see the, the greatest opportunities for efficiency gains actually lie then in, in that area, looking more internally at council yeah. costs yeah. rather than the yeah. shared service agenda? I, I, there's I, greater I, opportunities I, still I, I, there. I, I, I mean, I think, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's right. I think the back office costs of councils, um, just the process of paying somebody's uh, salary or paying a bill in a, in a local authority varies enormously. Now, you've got to get behind that and say, why? 
you should drive drive out the efficiencies, drive drive in the savings. It is something that councils need to continue to do. Councils um, kind of you know keep arguing, well, we're all different. Well, no, they're not really. They're, they're the same. They provide the same services. They do a lot of the same things, but they do it at a very differential cost. So there's a real opportunity in back office services to become become much more efficient. Mr. McKinnon. If, if I may briefly yes. continue. And I think the, the chair mentioned um, what's happening south of the border at the moment, and I think it's really fascinating to look at how local government's developing in England, and in particular um, things like city deals, city growth deals, which obviously Glasgow has one of now, and other cities are looking very closely at those in Scotland. And I think the other interesting thing um, that we can see is councils being much more entrepreneurial and looking at how they can actually generate more income mm. as well as becoming more efficient. Now, in a sense, that's been driven by, particularly in the big urban and metropolitan authorities in England, the scale of the, the budget reductions that they're dealing with, um, uh, which have been of a different order than the north of the border. But it is very interesting to see how innovative some are being about investing to earn uh, strategies, they would call it. So. Um, uh, investing money in things and projects, in some cases in start-up companies, um, in order to generate an, a return which can then be reinvested in public services. Now, we we really don't see much of that in Scotland yet, but depending on what happens with the financial uh, position over the next few years, I think that is something that we might see a bit more of. Um, with that kind of innovation, inevitably comes risk and capacity questions about how you do all of that, which as auditors we will obviously be wanting to keep a very close eye on. And my last question, if I can, yep. you, know, just, uh, you also mentioned the skills profile of local councillors, and uh, having been a councillor for many years, I can appreciate that and fully support that, and I think the councillors do a fantastic job with the resource that they have, but ultimately if we do achieve a real level of upskilling of the local elected members in Scotland, what kind of impact do you think that will really have? If, if you're basically dealing with a diminishing budget, I mean, there's, there's, there's a limit to what you can you can do here. And if you look at the skill, if you look at the profile of the local elected members, it hasn't really changed particularly much. It's pretty much uh, part-time or semi-retired, and an opportunity was perhaps missed some years ago, congener, to, to really influence the, the type of people you might attract into local government because the, the salary and remuneration for the councillors didn't really move particularly much. So that's a tricky subject to get into in terms of public perception of it, Mr Sinclair, but do you see that as being something that might be an influential, positive influence in this direction of travel for the delivery of local government services? Mr Sinclair? I, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, to some extent, you get what you pay for. Um, and it is difficult to broaden the, the, um, uh, the range of people able to stand for a count Stanford accounts it's very difficult for somebody who's in employment to be able to combine his responsibilities to his employer, his responsibility to the council. What they're entitled to is reasonable time off. Now, what does that mean? There's no guarantee of adequate time off. So I think we need to look quite critically at whether the current arrangements, including remuneration, are adequate to, to um, ensure that um, you're attracting a wide range of... The, you're actually attracting the best possible people um, to, to stand uh, for local government. Given that, given I say it is a big business, it's a, you know it's really important. It's a business becoming ever more complex. So I, as I said earlier, I think there's a debate to be had about not only how effective the training is, but whether the current arrangements in, in terms of time off for work and what have you are, are, are adequate. Yeah. 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 There's a yeah. lot of good talent. In Absolutely. The program, but they yeah. don't have that yeah. particular time to <coughs> devote to the, yeah. the tasks that they have yeah. to carry out. Thanks, Kim. Uh, thank you. Uh, Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, you keep mentioning the words as a debate to be had, particularly over certain aspects of uh, uh, in what external, so councils can get external advice. Um, and, and on investment, are you actually taking external advice, particularly on investment, because there's a debate to be had? I'm not too sure what you were saying about that. Is external advice being taken? Mr McKinley. Yeah. By councils, yes. By councils, yes. yes. So um, we did, uh, the Commission did a report recently on uh, how councils manage their borrowing, borrowing and treasury management. Um, one of the key findings in that was it's a, it's a professionally run service and they all have external advisors to help them with their borrowing and investment decisions. Um, what we did also say, though, is that it's very much seen as an officer-led and officer-driven process. And, and it's a kind of push and pull thing. So 
on one hand, officers who get on and do the job well can do more to make it easier for councillors to be involved and to ask the right questions uh, and to help them make those decisions. And equally, councillors need to be more demanding in asking for more information rather than just putting some really pretty significant decisions through uh, quite briefly on, on the nod. So, um, so, so there is um, advice being taken. The Commission has asked us to look now at, because that was, if you like, more traditional borrowing we looked at. The Commission have now asked us to look at areas like PFI and PPP, um, some of the more innovative forms of funding that we mentioned earlier. So we think that might be a wee stream of work um, that we begin to look at over the next couple of years about um, how they're how capital investment in particular is funded in other places. But, mm. but yes, in answer to your question, um, councils are, are, are pretty good at taking external advice on these things when they, when they need to. Thank you very much. Yes, you mentioned yeah. benchmarking. Are chief executives benchmarked of the councils? <laughs> Be, Mr. They McKinley, they, they would be subject to appraisal, uh, and they should be subject to appraisal within the council. And that appraisal should involve not just the leader of the council, but the leaders of all the political groups. And it's often uh, useful uh, and helpful to have an, uh, an outside person to help facilitate that appraisal process. But chief executives need to know how they're performing. Um, it might be an interesting question as to the extent to which leaders of council are appraised as well, but th those are more issues for the uh, individual political gr groups. But it's good practice for a chief executive to be to be appraised by, uh, and really by his peers, by his, his, his political masters, and ideally, I think, uh, with the help of um, uh, an outside person as well. That's important. Yeah. Sorry, are they yes, being appraised? Uh, I think, generally speaking, they are, yeah. I think, I think good chief executives would welcome an annual appraisal. They want to know how they're performing. They want to know the areas where they need to improve. They want to know whether the relationship with the, with the leader, with the convener, the leader of the other groups is effective uh, and, and whether there are issues that need to be resolved. Yeah. They should, the appraisal should be welcomed. Yeah. Okay, but there's no um, comparing and contrasting those appraisals afterwards in the benchmarking format that uh, Mr. Buchanan was well, I, uh, you know, I think asking it's, about. I think it's a myth that, you know, Bodies like COSLA say we're not in favour of league tables, but councils are very competitive with each other. They want to be the best, and so they should. Yep. Okay. Claire Adamson, please. Um, th thank you. Uh, just a, a couple of points. Um, I, too, served as a councillor, and you'll probably be um, pleased to know that the council that I served under did offer a personal development plan and training opportunities to councillors. And one of those that I undertook was on board training because I was been appointed to one of the council trusts. Um, um, but what was very clear in that training was that, that when I entered the board of that trust, I was responsible solely to that yeah. board. Um, so given that um, we're now seeing examples of value was being provided for roads, mm -hmm. for all sorts of um, areas, um, in extension to what they initially were, which was leisure trusts, mainly in the initial stages, um, do you have concerns that that democratic accountability is being lost to the council in the delivery of service through that model? Well, because at the end of the day, the council is still responsible for the quality of the service and the use of public money, any public money that's been invested in the ALIO. But it's really important that if you appoint councillors to the ALIO, that you understand their role, which is, as you rightly say, is to pursue the best interests of the, of the, of the ALIO. Uh, mm -hmm. But at the same time, they've got to balance the fact that they are still councillors uh, and there's a monitoring role uh, for the council to, to, to play. I think one of our concerns is the danger of councils setting up alios and just kind of forgetting about them. It's really important to monitor the performance of the alio to make sure that it's delivering the objectives that the council set out in the first place. I just make the point, you know, something I maybe should have said earlier, that um, but councillors, good quality councillors can make a real difference. One of the points in our school education report was that those councils that perform best in terms of attainment and achievement were those where the councillors played a very active role in setting clear targets to improve attainment and achievement and ensure that the performance of the council was benchmarked against comparable councils. So, you know, there's a real added value of councillors, the voice of councillors, the skills of councillors in holding officers to account and helping their council to improve. Um, if, if I could come back to the, the point you were making about um, the variation in cost of delivery of service. Um, this morning, Citizens Vice Scotland have had produced a report with concerns about the charging of certain mm. services. Now, obviously, yeah. um, you know, there's a council tax freeze on. Arguably, that was a, a, a tax that had 
raised considerably above the rate of inflation um, over the, the period in which it was in operation by up to 40% in some councils. Um, the report says that um, burial costs have increased by 10% in the last year, at a time when wages and, uh, are, you know, and, and there's restrictions on um, cost of living increases you know, for council employees in those areas. And also that there's a variation across the country where um, similar charges in the Western Isles can be 649 compared to over £2,000 um, in central areas. Do you have any concerns about the variation or do you think that's just down to the councillors to decide the charging policy in those areas or do those kinds of variations cause you some concern? Mr Sinclair. Um, well, I mean, it's fair to say that councils do rely on the income they get from charges. I think it's 1.3 billion pounds, something like that. It's a lot of money um, to some extent um, as a consequence of the council tax freeze. I think it's fair to say that some differences are understandable and justifiable because the cost of providing a service, say, in the Western Isles as opposed to Edinburgh could well be different, but I don't think they're all justifiable. Uh, I think it's really important that, can, that councils, and we, we did a How Councils Work series on, on charging, that councils are, need to be very transparent as to why that is costing that and be able to justify it with me, not just a figure plucked out of the air, but to be able to, to justify to the public that's the cost, and here's the background to why the cost is, is that. I think there's a, quite a lot of concern about car park charges, that it's a kind of cash cow for councils, and I think councils could help themselves by actually explaining more clearly what is the cost of administering car parking. Does the income from that car parking transparently go back into the road, the road maintenance programme, or does it just go back into the central coffers of the council? So I think councils could do more in explaining to the public the rationale behind their, their charging policy. We do believe it's really important that every council is very clear uh, a charging policy and explains that effectively to their, the, to their public. Thank you. Okay. Cara Halton, please. Um, yeah, thank you, convener. Um, just sticking with the sort of financial context, I'd just be interested to know more about how the reduction in um, funding allocation to local authorities compares with the sort of the, the cut from Westminster to the Scottish Government. Is it a proportionate cut that's been passed on to local authorities? I think I'm right in saying is that the, the cut to local government, the 8.5 per cent um, to and up to 13, 14, reflected the cut, the 8.5 per cent cut to the Scottish Government. Yep. It, yes, it it's, yep. it's broadly re reflects the, the same proportions. It's, yep. it's difficult to totally disentangle, but we um, there's not much in it. It's a pro totally different question, to be fair. Um, but just in the report, um, you talk about um, the growing population and the impact that this is going to have on council education services. And obviously, education takes up quite a high percentage of council's budgets, 30%, and I think in Fife, it's about, about 45% of the, uh, the local authority's budget. So how would you say that local authorities can prepare for the extra budget and challenges as a result of the growth in the number of children, um, particularly in the 0 to 5 Year old. Um, we've already seen local authorities have a look at um, possible cuts to the school week um, to address this issue. And I'm thinking particularly in the context of national policies, such as the expansion of early years to maybe 30 hours a week. Um, how can local authorities prepare for these budgetary challenges? Mr. Sinclair. The short answer is a great deal of difficulty because it's not only the increase in the school population, it's the increase in the, in the over 65s. You're going to have a 25% increase by 2037, so there's pressures at that end of the age spectrum and pressures at the other end of the age spectrum. I think it kind of um, emphasises the point that, that Mr McKinley made about the importance of long-term financial planning, of building in these factors and making sure that you take account of them so that they don't come as a surprise. One of the concerns that we've uh, highlighted in this report is the fact that 18 councils have not got long-term financial plans, and that, that is a concern. Mr. McKinley. Briefly, Convener, thank you. I think there's also an interesting thing here about the, the kind of starting point for the discussion around some of these big decisions. And I was speaking to a council chief exec recently who said, yes, our budget for education and schools has reduced, but we're still spending £300 million a year. So the starting point in that council was, with his senior team in the education department, how, how would we spend £300 million on education in this authority uh, uh, looking ahead to the five years, rather than how are we going to manage taking out whatever it was, £10 million a year? So, so, and I know that doesn't, that's not easy and it doesn't make it all go away, but there is an interesting thing for me about your starting point yeah. and, your, and your outlook on these things. And if we're really seriously getting into a world of having to think 
quite differently about how services are delivered, I think that's a more helpful starting point rather than trying to figure out how you manage, you know, a 5% cut. Thank you. Uh, John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. The more the witnesses speak, the more questions come up. Uh, but I, don't, I know, I know, Convener, I've agreed to stick to two, but <laughs> I'll raise other ones. I uh, want to go back to the issue Claire Adamson raised about the Alios issue. Uh, and about, no, quite clearly you're saying there should be democratic accountability. We had a situation recently in one local authority where councillors were sitting making a decision about funding being provided to Nalio, and nobody was clear about who could participate in the vote uh, to make the decision because so many of them sat on various boards of Alios. I know there's work being done on that. When can we expect the findings on that work to be released and advice being given to local authorities about who should be making decisions uh, if they're sitting on boards of alios at the same time as sitting in the same committee. Who's going to take that on? Yeah, I'm happy to. We, the Commission um, had a, a, a very useful briefing from um, Mr McKinley on alios earlier this year. And what we've done, I'll just read this out to you. We've sent a letter to councils encouraging them to apply good practice more consistently across alios, highlighting the importance of strong governance for alios, particularly around minimising potential conflicts of interest, ensuring regular and proportionate monitoring, including clauses for review and termination in funding arrangements. And we sent that to every council leader, the chair of the audit committee and the chief executive of the council. We also sent a guidance note to external auditors to assist in their audit of council's governance and funding arrangements with alios, drawing particular attention to the practical guidance and following the public pound. And we've agreed that by autumn of this year, we'll undertake a review of following the public pound in conjunction with an update of the definition of alios to assist councils to apply the principles of good governance to the funding arrangements for alios and similar bodies. Uh, we also intend, through an iteration of best value, to um, promote a stronger consideration of alios in our scrutiny work, particularly through the shared risk assessment, and also to support training and information events with the local government community, for example, seminars and conferences involving Audit Scotland, the charity regulator COSLA and the Improvement Service, including reference as appropriate to the Commission's earlier report on how councils work. So we're, we've very much got this in, in uh, our line of sight, and we recognise the importance of the issues. Alios, I think in 2012-13, the spend was uh, £1.3 billion, and they employ something like 25,000 people. So they are, you know, they are... They're a permanent part of the of the public sector landscape now, and we we need to ensure that there's the subject of proper scrutiny and members understand their relationship to them. Can I ask that we get a copy of that letter, Mr. Yep, Sinclair? Certainly. Please. Yep. Just to follow up on that, convener, could I suggest when you're sending letters like that, you mentioned the chief executives, council leaders, uh, and chair of audit or scrutiny yep. panels. Could I suggest that in future you get that letters or those letters circulated to all elected members okay. uh, to ensure that everybody in the council knows what's being said so that they know it's okay. just not a select few sure. uh, okay. so that, as I said, they can all participate. Follow-up question, yeah. is, it ties into best value issue. Uh, and we, we've had some discussion and I'd refer uh, the panel to my speech last week in terms of community empowerment bill where I made the, the point about best value not being purely monetary terms, that it has to be social, economic and environmental terms for many communities throughout Scotland. Uh, and when can we expect that reassessment uh, from the, the or revision of the 2003-04 guidance on best value in relation to the work that's been done? Well, it's, it's fair to say I think we, we, we believe there's a lot in the statutory guidance of 2003 which is as relevant today as it was then. It stood the, the test of time, as Mr McKinley has indicated. There are a number of areas where it does need updating. I think more focus, for example, on options appraisal, more focus on scrutiny, some of the areas that you mentioned in, in terms of engagement with communities. Our intention is that the um, next iteration of best value uh, I, I will not call it best value three, or otherwise I'll get into trouble with the controller, uh, will, will be rolled out by May 2016. One of the interesting points about the next iteration is that it will cover all 32 councils. Um, the uh, proportionate and shared risk assessment, 
approach to best value has been has been welcomed by councils because it was proportionate and risk based. But as a consequence, there are half of Scotland's councils that have not had a best value review since 2005. Now that, that that means that public are not getting assurance about how well their council is performing or otherwise. So we think it's important uh, continuing to use the shared risk assessment that best value embraces all councils and that we can identify not only poor practice but also good practice in councils. So that's our target date, May 2016. Okay, uh, I wonder if uh, we could go through a, a few quick fire questions and answers of areas which we've covered to an extent but maybe not enough. Um, you said, Mr Sinclair, that only 18 out of the 32 local authorities um, have a, a, a long term financial plan. No, I said 18 don't. 18 don't, yeah. 14 mm -hmm. out of 32. Yeah. Right. That makes it worse then. Yeah. Um, what are, uh, are yourself and Audit Scotland doing to encourage those local authorities that don't have long-term financial plans to actually uh, get in gear uh, and, and start formulating uh, these plans? Um, so we, for example, convener expect, uh, and most councils do consider this report, the uh, overview report. Uh, similarly, we did a report uh, a wee while ago specifically on developing financial reporting, which talks specifically about this issue. And our auditors in all 32 councils will be routinely, as part of the annual audit process, encouraging, as you say, councils to um, to do that long-term financial planning. So, so we're continuing to bang the drum uh, and and do what we can locally to make sure that the councils are doing this. And if they still do not, what is powers are at your disposal to try and get them to a position where they see sense and actually have uh, long-term financial plans? So that would be through the the annual reporting process. So every year, the 32 council auditors report to me as controller of audit in September. Um, and that would be a mechanism through which if uh, councils are continuing not to plan for the medium and long term, um, I could either raise it on an individual basis to the Commission or we can um, give it more prominence uh, in the overview report. So we don't have any sanctions as such to make them do it. Ultimately, it's for councils to do that. But there are ways in which we can increase the pressure if they're not moving on there. If you were in a, a punter in a local authority that uh, didn't have a long-term financial plan, would you be worried about the situation? <laughs> um, I think they should be, but, but in, importantly for me, convener, not because of what the auditors might do, um, because having a long-term financial plan is a really important thing. Uh, I think that's why they should be worried about not having one rather than us coming uh, and giving them a hard time, although that might help a bit. Okay. In terms of benchmarking, which we've touched upon, and you know that this uh, committee has taken a great interest in the work that's that's gone on thus far, um, Mr. Sinclair, you you compared uh, local authorities in terms of council tax collection costs. Um, have we seen anything out there um, which tells us that councils are actually taking cognizance? Uh, of some of the benchmarking statistics that they're getting? Um, and uh, have we uh, got proof that actions are being taken in certain of these areas to, to drive forward improvement? Yep, I, th I think we have. It's interesting, just a quote from the National Benchmarking Overview Report 2013 states, the headline figure for Scotland as a whole is that councils have continued to make substantial improvements in efficiency and productivity so that the cost of the delivery of services is reduced while service output and outcomes have been maintained and improved. So uh, there is evidence that they're, they're, doing, they're doing reasonably well. That isn't to say there isn't, a, there isn't a lot more they can do, but the direction of travel is a positive one. Mr McKinley? For my part, I think there, I know that there is a lot of activity, so people are looking at it and using it, and the family groupings are, are getting up and running. Uh, I know you've already asked the Improvement Service and Solace for some examples of where we can then actually see what's happened as a result of that activity. And I think that's really going to be the key test now is um, over the last year to two years, the, the activity is building. The question now is how, where are we actually seeing the, as, as the chair says, the output and the outcome of that in terms of actual um, practical service change. I, I think that's the bit that, that we're still waiting to see more examples of. And, I, and again, it's worth making the point that in the next iteration of best value, that's an area we will look at in much more detail. Uh, it's certainly an area that this committee will continue yeah. to, to look at. Um, a, a couple of questions round about um, uh, 
some of the other things that we have been focusing on of late as a committee. Can I ask you what, to what extent do you think local authorities and CPPs are now focusing on outcomes when they're planning um, services and taking decisions? Is that improving? Hmm. Do do that? Um, so the short answer to that, I think, is yes. I think it is improving. I think the last uh, national report the Commission and the Auditor General did around community planning said that there is evidence that, hmm. certainly at local level, it's much more embedded than it was, some good examples of local partnership working. Um, there is still, though, a long way to go, particularly around areas like understanding the finances and how you share budgets and how you share assets. Um, I think the Community Impairment Bill is important in that context about how people are looking at assets that the public sector have, never mind just councils, and how that might be better used. So, so yeah, I think the focus is there. I think if you look back five, ten years, there is a real shift in how people operate and the extent to which uh, partnership and collaboration is much more part of the everyday work of, of councils and their partners. Um, and similarly, I think we're still to see the real benefit of that being delivered in terms of you know, real service transformation and services being delivered in a, in a, in a really different and changed way. Thank you. We touched earlier upon uh, Marshall Square and Castle Towered um, and have talked a fair bit today about the Community Empowerment Bill. Do you think that uh, local authorities and CPPs um, are ready for the Community Empowerment Bill um, and are uh, ready for devolving uh, power to, to local people and communities? that one from me, Chair? <laughs> Do you want to go first then, Mr yeah, McKinley? The, the, the million dollar question. So th this is, Cathy will give me a kick for this because it's not really based on any audit evidence, so with that caveat. Um, so uh, my sense is that people in councils are dead up for it. I think uh, at the senior level people think that it, it's, a good, it's a good idea. And I think it's a very, very big change. And I think it challenges quite fundamentally a very long history of how local governance has worked in this country. I think it, it's, it comes at an interesting time of, I think, what's happening to, to Mr McCann mentioned, mentioned the debate. I think there is a, quite a big debate still going on and still to progress about what local governance looks like. So not in terms of structure, but in terms of the relationship between councils and communities and, and the Community Impairment Bill is obviously part of that, but we've got the from last year, the Commission on Strengthening Local Democracy, the Islands uh, discussion ongoing as well. So I think those plates are continuing to move and shift. Um, I, I really hope that they do embrace it. As I said right at the start, I think there is a real opportunity here that helps improve outcomes, improve services, potentially save some money and to get people engaged in it. So I would be... Um, as auditors, we are required to be professionally sceptical, Communion, as you know, and so I suppose that would be my position. Mr Sinclair, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, you know, the, the cliché that the council closer to its communities is closer to its needs is, is very true. I suppose my slight worry, my niggle is capacity. Uh, you put a lot of new obligations on councils, whether they have the capacity, given the reductions in staffing that they've had, to take on these new responsibilities will, 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 will be something that we'll want to monitor and, and, and keep a close eye on. OK, and you're ready for the auditing challenge of all of this? We are indeed, Kimbia. Yep. OK, can I thank you very much for your evidence today. Um, I suspend this meeting and we move into private session. Thank you. Thank you.